Woohoo, we're live. Okay, so I'm just gonna wait to see who joins. And I literally say the same thing at the beginning of all my lives, and I feel bad because for people that are gonna like rewatch these lives, they're like, wow, she starts this live the same every time. Hey, ladies. So I'm just gonna wait for everyone to join that's gonna join. And then I have two questions that were requested in the DMs that I'm going to answer really quickly. And then if you guys have questions, obviously just ask them in the comments and we'll get to it. Um, I do want to let you know that I just always need to preface this now for like legality reasons. It's just like, this is not medical advice. You guys know that this is us discussing things and me kind of pointing you in the right direction and me hoping that you're going to go take that information, do your own research and kind of use it as like a trampoline to like, you know, go in the right direction so you know it's my job to kind of tell you what to look into and look for and ask your doctor for but it's not medical advice it's it's really for education and inspiration um so bella asked me in the dm she's a fully nourished student and she was saying that she's feeling so good doing fully nourished but she has been a vegan and a vegetarian for over 10 years and so she thinks she has low stomach acid because she has a really hard time digesting she's been doing the hcl challenge and she's gotten up to eight full pills with no burning sensation and she feels like her workouts she said deplete her stomach acid and make her digestion feel dry and lead to her having bloating and gas and she was wondering like what to do about it is it the workouts like what's going on so Bella this is kind of one of those things where your body might be telling you that working out is not doing you very much good a lot of us don't realize because of the culture that we live in that exercise does stress our bodies out quite a bit so um, exercise while we're exercising our guts actually become more leaky to allow more nutrients in the bloodstream quickly right because our body knows that when we're exerting ourselves we're gonna need a higher need for nutrients our cells are gonna have higher requirements for for nutrients for calories for fats proteins carbs and so our our guts actually open up to allow things to come into the bloodstream more we would call this term leaky gut right but it's just our our body's kind of um, adjusting itself and adapting to the stress we're placing it under and so when you have severe gut issues right you don't want those cells to like be pulling apart to allow whatever's coming through come through and a lot of times when you have imbalanced gut bacteria you're creating a lot of toxins there's a lot of waste byproducts specifically lactic acid that is getting into your bloodstream and causing inflammation it's gonna cause you to feel gas and bloating exercise also disrupts gut bacteria quite a bit and so if you already have really bad gut health and then you're exercising and you feel really horrible afterwards digestive wise that's just showing that a lot of blood flow is going away from your digestive system and the bacteria is really being disrupted so in these cases it's kind of one of those things where you truly have to experiment sometimes exercise is doing you more harm than good and it needs to be taken a break from you kind of need to give your body a rest for a while and focus on more restorative things focus on that time because a lot of us don't realize that we only have so much time in a day right and so sometimes we're putting our energy into habits that are not really su supporting us or or helping us in any way and so I always say take that time that you would spend working out and go lay in the sunshine that's one of the best things we can do for gut health is allow our body to synthesize and make its own vitamin D if you're trying to heal your gut and you're having gut issues and you're not laying in the sunshine, do that instead of working out because that's gonna not only help you build muscle and burn fat, but it's also gonna help heal your gut. Something as simple as laying in the sunshine. So it's it's one of those things where you have to weigh the pros and cons, but if you're having really, like your body's telling you after each workout that, that digestion's not working, maybe workouts are not working for you. And then when it comes to Morgan's question, so Morgan said that she started natural desiccated thyroid um, a, a little while ago, she's on a quarter of a grain, so that is um, 15 milligrams, I believe, and she feels like she has to eat and use more orange juice to keep her blood sugar up. Does this mean that her metabolism is working better? Yes, so a lot of times when we implement thyroid, we do need to understand that when we take natural desiccated thyroid we are increasing our cellular metabolism and so if our metabolism is speeding up we don't want to hit the gas without adding fuel to the tank right and so sometimes people make the mistake of taking natural desiccated thyroid going on a low carb diet not eating enough carbohydrates and they feel like crap because their body is having to break itself down using cortisol to create blood glucose and to create fuel and so yes when you start thyroid medication a lot of times you do have an increased need for carbohydrates and just an increased need for fuel in general or you'll feel really crappy but 
but you will feel more hungry. You will feel the need to actually eat more frequently. And this is a good thing, right? Our appetite is a gift. It's a sign that we're using fuel efficiently. It's just like if we were driving in a car and our fuel light comes on, it's telling us, hey, we're using fuel. We need to put more fuel in the tank. So I hope that makes sense. But yes, when we take thyroid medication, very often we need to make sure we're really making sure we're fueling our metabolism well. And then Impress Me is saying, she turns out she probably has endometriosis as well on top of PCOS. I'm so sorry, girls. So remember that endometriosis is driven by bacterial infections usually. And keep in mind, endotoxins are those toxins that your bacteria create and endometriosis. See the, see the, um, the, the friendship there. So endometriosis is very often driven by bacteria. This is why it responds really well to antibiotics. This is why it responds really well to like things like berberine, like all these anti, um, bacterials and antifungals that are natural. And, uh, I find that a lot of times when women have severe gut issues, they very often have endometriosis or vice versa they like you know they're like what's wrong why why do you have such bad endometriosis and you look at their gut and it's just really really wrecked and then a lot of times estrogen is also playing a role so you know chronic constipation plays a role in endometriosis and then keep in mind it is fibrosis of the tissue so fibrosis is like scar tissue or inflammation of specific tissues and that is happening a lot of times because things are leaking into the bloodstream from the gut and it's causing inflammation actually fibrosis of certain tissues or calcification and so it's our job to really focus on our gut health first to stop those toxins from leaking into the bloodstream and then to work on that scar tissue things like proteolytic enzymes things like that and then work on on the hormone side let's lower let's lower estrogen let's raise progesterone let's make sure we're not super stressed out because cortisol is gonna drive fibrosis of the tissue and we got to make sure that our whole body is functioning as a whole to me endometriosis is just really really severe um, hormonal and bacterial disruption that has kind of like catapulted under uh, out of control and this is why a lot of women with endometriosis find really a lot of benefit or I don't want to say benefit but I'll find a lot of symptom reduction when they take birth control it's because they're just shutting their cycle down they're shutting everything down and they're like you know they think oh I'm cured or I'm healed and it's really there's a fire burning beneath the surface it's just now they f their symptoms are better so endometriosis is kind of a complicated condition. I think it really does have a lot of bacterial um, dry. This is why iodine works really well in that in those cases. It's why a lot of like herbals and things work really well. Um, but that makes sense in your case, right? Because we know what's going on. Um, I always felt I had abdominal adhesions. I don't want to get surgery and IDK what to do to get rid of them naturally. Um, it's one of those things where we got to stop focusing on the actual issues and, and really focus on what's driving the issues because we can try to like work on our abdominal adhesions, but then we're going to, they're going to come back, right? If we're not fixing what's driving the fibrosis and the issue. So just kind of seeing it that way. Hi, I'm super curious about your stance on alcohol. Do you drink it? Are there certain times of the month that are better than others or should we just swear it off? I don't think it's good to like swear it off if you enjoy it. I think it's like one of those things where I really approach things with balance, but I also approach things with self-awareness. You guys, like for me, I have goals I want to achieve. I, I, you know, for me, my body is a vehicle to pursue my purpose to build this business. Like for me, I don't, I don't, I can't afford to wake up the next day and feel like shit for 24 hours. You know what I mean? And I can really admit to myself that alcohol really does not serve me in any way. I know on a hormonal scale that it does not serve you in any way. It, your, your body has to prioritize it. It's a toxin, right? It's a legal toxin. So we look at certain drugs that are illegal and we say, oh, those are so much worse than this because it's, Ill, you know, one's illegal and one's legal. And I'm like, really? No, no, no. Alcohol is a drug. Alcohol is a toxin. Our body has to prioritize um, detox it over everything else including your hormones so honest to god if you're trying to heal things get it out of your life you swear it off um that's my on my own personal opinion there's all these people like balance and this and that i'm like alcohol does not serve you in literally any way it literally just burdens your liver for 24 hours it depletes you of b vitamins and your body is literally b vitamins like for to, if i was like i could explain the science behind b vitamins forever and i probably will do a story at one point on them but we have to understand that b vitamins when we're trying to heal are gold they are valuable and when we drink alcohol we're just wasting b vitamins our body has to deplete them very very quickly and when we're under stress we're already depleted of b vitamins and so we really can't afford to lose those so honestly if you are struggling a lot with hormones alcohol is not going to work for you in any way now it's not like one of those things where like 
I find that some women have like a weird relationship with alcohol or they're still having like a rocky relationship with alcohol that they're not really ready to face and so sometimes cutting alcohol completely leads to alcohol binges and I don't think that that is really helpful either so it's one of those things where sometimes alcohol is something that we use to loosen up because we're not like really comfortable with something and this is not me saying anything to you it's just like me bringing the awareness that sometimes we have to like really get real with ourselves and say like why are we like really um, against or defensive if we have to give up alcohol what is it doing for me is it is it allowing me to loosen up around people that I don't feel comfortable around is it something that helps me relax well what the heck why am I so stressed out that I can't relax without alcohol you know we have to like start really digging in or is it just that we truly enjoy it so many women when they start to dive into their relationship with alcohol they don't come to the conclusion like I truly enjoy it they are not like they you know they have to unwind at the end of a long week on a Friday night with two glasses of wine because they can't relax okay let's like look at the whole week like why is your life so stressful is it a job that you hate are you in a relationship that's really not making you happy you know what's going on if it's just like I want to have a glass of wine with girlfriends that's fine um, but you know all this to say is alcohol is more of a complicated thing than just saying like you know when should I drink it when should I not it's kind of like why do we need to drink it and um, if we're really trying to heal things and we're really trying to restore function to certain things, we probably should just give it up completely. If I was gonna drink alcohol, I wouldn't drink it during menstruation. I don't like alcohol, you guys. So that's like my biggest thing is like, I honestly don't like it. Like to me, I could live without it and be like, eh, whatever. I'd rather have a piece of chocolate cake, seriously. Like I just don't care for alcohol. Like I'll drink a beer once in a while or a cider or a glass of wine. It's not like I like hate it, but for me, I could never drink it again and I'd be like, fine. I never really acquired a taste for it. I just like don't really drink it a lot because I started my healing journey when I was like 18 years old before I could even legally drink. And so by the time I turned 21, one, my habits were already like down packed, didn't really want to do anything that was going to hurt my body. So for me, I like have never really acquired a taste for it. But if you enjoy it, I think my favorite time would be like second week. So follicular phase would probably be the best. Um, but if you had estrogen issues and you have really symptomatic ovulation, I would skip it during the follicular phase and save it for the luteal phase. So it kind of like, I don't know, it's like really hard if you're having hormonal problems, I can't really pinpoint a time where it's not going to affect you because you have that estrogen spike pre ovulation, right? And so if you're having a hard time detoxifying estrogen, you don't want to do it then. And keep in mind, alcohol is estrogenic. And then, you know, you have that second half of the cycle where if you have a really pain full or symptomatic period you don't want to be burdening your body during the luteal phase but if you're going to do it I would do it like at the beginning of the luteal phase rather than like the week before your period but that was a long answer for a really basic question I'm sorry <laughs> um, why do I get phlegm from dairy if you get phlegm from dairy a lot of times see what we have done in our culture we we've decided that we're going to demonize a food when in reality if dairy is causing symptoms you've already got bacterial overgrowth and that dairy is just expressing those symptoms a lot of times women are maybe um, they have some histamine issues going on, some inflammation, and so they need to, to opt for A2 dairy for a while which is going to be like sheep's milk, goat's milk, things like that. And then any type of European like French cheeses and milks or like A2 specific milks. Um, but if it gives you phlegm, it is an issue with bacteria. Keep in mind that um, milk has something called lactoferrin in it, which is super antibacterial. But if we are drinking homogenized milk, it creates more oxygen in the gut. And keep in mind that our good bacteria cannot thrive in oxygen rich environments environments but pathogenic bacteria do create uh, do thrive in oxygen rich environments so first of all make sure your milk's not homogenized because that's when they push those fat globules through these little aeration like holes and and create oxygen in the milk and sometimes that could really irritate the gut um, and then if that's not the issue then keep in mind that milk is made to actually feed certain strains of bacteria um, in a baby or in a baby cow so that that their guts proliferate because we're born with sterile leaky guts and so when we have like severe bacterial overgrowth the the milk that has special probiotics and prebiotics in it are going to fe feed that bacterial overgrowth that does not mean that milk is bad it means that there's a bacterial overgrowth in your gut that needs to be dealt with but overall um, it, it's most likely a bacterial or a fungal overgrowth that's causing that issue my doctor prescribed me low-dose naltrexone for my Hashimoto's what are your thoughts 
Um, I think LDN can be helpful in certain cases. It's not like a fix-all or cure-all. I think it's like one of those things where you need to see like, okay, it has therapeutic benefits. Um, some people see zero effects and some people see amazing effects. So I think for me, like I've experimented with just about everything in my life. Like I've taken all the medications and all the this and all the that. And it's like, for me, LDN was just like, me I, I honestly did not see a benefit I wasn't willing to drop the like 80 bucks a month on it um, but for some people it is really helpful now we always have to say when it comes to Hashimoto's hopefully your doctor understands that Hashimoto's is a thyroid inflammation condition hopefully they talked to, to you about pesticides and heavy metals being a huge role to play in inflammation in the thyroid hopefully they talked about how estrogen is completely anti-thyroid and progesterone is pro-thyroid and hopefully they checked all your sex hormones and then also hopefully they did a comprehensive gut test to see what bacteria and pathogens could be um, inflaming your body as a whole and then uh, checked on your liver as well all of those things can contribute to Hashimoto's symptoms and if they're not being dealt with no amount of LDN is gonna fix you overall it might help your symptoms but if your goal is to truly get to a point where you have found true healing or you want to see a reversal of symptoms you've got to get to the root of what's driving that thyroid inflammation to me, it's not a good enough answer for someone to tell me like, oh, your body's attacking your thyroid. Mm -mm -mm. No, there are antibodies for a reason. The body does everything for a reason. So what's going on? And a lot of times it has to do with endotoxins, pesticides, heavy metals, um, and uh, stress issues on top of, um, you know, poor nutrition, not the right thyroid nutrition, um, gut and liver issues. <clears throat> Hey Jess, the top of my fingernails have a tendency to peel in layers. Is this due to some vitamin deficiency? Thank you. Yeah, it totally can be. A lot of times it's B vitamins. Um, it can also be minerals. So at that point, like when my clients have like really, um, you know, bad hair or skin or nail issues, um, HDMA, like a hair mineral analysis can be helpful. I'm actually going to take a course on it this month, like to learn it a lot better because for me, like I'm always like wanting to hone my knowledge, but I'm going to talk about it a lot more with you guys um, in the your future I just like I believe in hair mineral analysis but I, for me like I only know the basics and I want to know the test really really well before I start offering it to clients and offering it in my one-on-one -on -one services but I'll definitely like take you guys through that but that could be like a zinc deficiency it could be copper it could be like like I said the B vitamins um, it could be like those smaller minerals like iodine molybdenum like boron like all those types of minerals so for like for issues like that I always just pay attention like I always just see like those are symptoms that you can't necessarily be like oh, you know I'm like doing this because my nails peel but it's a good idea to pay attention to if those things improve or get worse based on certain habits those are like why I always say like you want to track your symptoms not because you're like obsessed with your symptoms like oh my god today like I got a red spot on my face but it's more just like noticing the patterns of your body which is comes with honoring your body or respecting your body you know when your body cries out you listen so I would definitely pay attention to that over the course of the next couple of months as you implement more nutrient dense nutrition and kind of like hone in on your stress and everything um, and go from there but I yeah that can definitely be a mineral deficiency um, it could also be like thyroid issues stress issues I mean it could be a lot can coffee enemas help relieve chronic constipation and improve bowel transit time? They can. They can. Now, you can get addicted to coffee enemas. I will give that preface. Like, some people are chronically constipated and they start doing coffee enemas and they're like, oh my god, this feels so good to actually like, poop every day, that they start doing them every day and their bowels become kind of reliant upon them. Um, but as long as they're not too high volume, a lot of times that's fine. Once people are, like, filling their colon with, like, eight cups of water and, and, doing that every single day the body's getting used to that like full voluminous feeling and then the bowels can't contract but as like a kind of an abstract view like think about it coffee enemas are are removing lots of bacteria that could be causing a contraction to not happen um inflammation can be causing that muscular contraction to not happen because we have to think of the bowel like the bowel is a muscle that has this contraction which is supposed to push the stool out a lot of people that are chronically constipated have such bad bacterial overgrowth or such bad inflammation in the gut or the mucosal barrier is so broken that that muscle contraction is not happening think of like a tube that's supposed to be like one millimeter thick that's like an inch thick it, it you're it can't move right it can't move quite it doesn't have the dexterity that it's supposed to so in that case a lot of times coffee enemas can help but they're, they're not for everybody so I think it's really good to be conservative and to be careful 
and to go from there like it's always good to approach things like carefully and with ease and then see how your body reacts and then go further but yeah it could totally improve just about everything because it's it's not only supporting you know the gut but it's also sending that caffeine to the liver which is going to help move bile Hi Jess, any thoughts on Andy Cutler protocol for mercury poisoning? I have high values of mercury. I'm not familiar with Andy Cutler, but I'm gonna write that down right now. I don't know if it's a boy or a girl, because I know Andy can be a girl or a boy name. Um, and I, um, whenever it comes from mercury poisoning or toxic metal poisoning, everyone needs to be very, very careful with heavy metals. There's all these practitioners talking about like, oh, you need to detox your heavy metals. And I'm like, it is so dangerous <laughs> to detox heavy metals if you're like constipated or you have severe metabolic issues, like you have really like um, low or high cortisol or low thyroid function. Like your body cannot carry that me those metals out properly. And there are actually studies showing that if people are doing heavy metal detoxes and they can't get them out of the body those heavy metals end up in the brain and they end up in the kidneys very high values of these metals are showing up in those in those organs that we don't want heavy metals ending up in the brain right if we're mobilizing heavy metals you do not want them to just end up anywhere you want your body to be able to carry them out and so a lot of people are trying to force their body into detoxification not understanding that if the body is not does not have the system set up to move those metals out properly they're going to cause a lot more harm than good so for me i think that more natural methods of heavy metal detoxification are important orange juice is a great heavy metal detoxifier coffee also um, gently detoxifies and chelates heavy metals that's why coffee enemas do, done daily like over the course of months can actually make you anemic because they're so good at drawing like iron to them and other heavy metals to them um, and then uh, things like silica, especially from sourced from horsetail, can be helpful. Um, uh, modified citrus pectin can be helpful, but it's so important to do it as an overarching gut protocol because you want to make sure those things are moving properly. Um, and I'm not familiar with this protocol, so I need to look into it uh, before I can say any more. What brand of vitamin K do I take? Um, I kind of experiment from, from brand to brand, but I've been taking one called Mary Ruth's. Um, it's sourced from Natto, which is, it's, it's powerful, but the only thing is I've taken a whole bottle of it. I was going to reorder it. I'm a little annoyed because it's, it's low potency. So I take aspirin as a, as a preventative. I take one uh, full dose aspirin every single day, which is 325 milligrams. And you want to take a thousand micrograms of K to every 325 milligrams of aspirin and to do that I have to take a like a couple dropper fulls of Mary's which ends up not really lasting me more than like a couple weeks so um, I might end up going for Jero which is a little less um, expensive and it goes a little farther but I truly do like to take as many supplements under the tongue or topically as possible because anytime it's gonna go into the digestive tract you have a more of a likelihood to in inflame the gut or irritate the gut just because you don't know which kind of, uh, of additives in that supplement are going to maybe irritate you. So I've done Jero, I've done Mary Ruth's, um, I've also done Thorn. I like Thorn as well. So um, I kind of like switch it up and for some some supplements. I just kind of find, um, for me, like I am always like this master experimenter. So as long as something is pure for me and as long as it is, you know, low additives and um, the brand quality is high, I'll try something new to see how my body responds to it until I really find a brand that I really truly like. And I want to stick to whatever it is if it's the the delivery method or if it actually truly makes me feel good overall but um i um for vitamin k i try to stick to one that you can afford and then that's pretty high quality Jero tends to be pretty good five months of severe pain on my left side at my waist off and on causes nausea as well been through testing can't seem to get answers my energy level is way down too sudden food intolerance too yeah so um that's usually i mean if if it's your Left side, like high up underneath the ribs, that's a lot of times the pancreas. Um, if it's the pancreas, pancreatic enzymes can help. Um, uh, if it is gut issues, that could also be the cause. Keep in mind, you guys, that our stomach is right on that left side, but then drop into the small intestine, which is right, I'll kind of get up right here. So right here, and then our large intestine goes all the way around. And so sometimes people think like, oh God, my left side's hurting like up here, and they think it's like small intestine, 
intestine or the upper intestine or the stomach. And in reality, it's actually their large intestine, but it's at the top. It's when it's kind of going around. So it could be a few things. If you haven't gotten a, if you're, um, I know a lot of people on here uh, that follow me are like low carbers, or ketoers, post low carb or ketoers. If you've been low carb, keep in mind it destroys lots of good strains of metabolic bacteria and it also is very harsh on the pancreas. So I always make sure that people are checking out their pancreas. Um, something as simple as taking pancreatic enzymes usually helps with that. Um, or it could be gut issues. And in that case, a lot of times I'll like to do a, a GI map or a comprehensive stool analysis post keto to see what damage has, has occurred. What, is, um, what strains have died off? what have overgrown and a lot of these strains that we kill on keto sometimes we kill them completely and we can never get them back and they are the most pro metabolic pro thyroid anti cancer strains of bacteria and we have allowed all these really um, negative bacteria to take up residence in their place and so it really does take some work to get the gut back to how it was um, it was before um, also if it's the upper left side, I, I would bet it's pancreas or some type of large intestine issue. Um, but it could also be, have something to do with like bile flow or the stomach itself, like H. pylori, a bacterial um, residence in the stomach. But yeah, I, I'm just throwing out some ideas. But yeah, I'm not really sure exactly what that could be. But I would look into the pancreas. Can you discuss why period may get pushed off when traveling? Yeah, so everyone is always obsessed with their period that they forget that the star of the show is ovulation, right? We always forget the period is not is not the star of the show, you guys. Your ovulation is the star of the show. And so many people are worried that, um, you know, oh my God, my period's late. And I'm like, what did you do two weeks ago? What's going on? What, what happened two weeks ago? Were you stressed out preparing for your vacation? Were you traveling um, during that time or getting ready to travel? Were you, you know, wrapping up all these loose ends and everything stressed out of your mind? Okay, stress probably, um, prolonged ovulation, probably prolonged the follicular phase, you ovulated late, therefore you're going to have your period late. Keep in mind, you guys, your luteal phase is going to last anywhere from 11 to 14 days in a really healthy individual. And so if you ovulated late, you're going to have a longer, you're going to still have a luteal phase that's going to last the same amount of time. And so your period's going to come a few days late. This is why tracking ovulation is so important because if you know when you ovulate, you know when you're going to have your period. And if you ovulated five days later, this cycle, you're gonna be like, okay, my period's probably gonna come five days later. So it's really about knowing your body, but when you have a late period, you had a late ovulation, if that makes sense. What do you recommend for Polaris, Kataris, bulls, and why do they happen? Um, I'm not sure. I think that might be a typo, but I'm not sure. <laughs> um, uh, Polaris, Kataris, I'm thinking you might have, have put in um, Keratosis Polaris, but I'm not sure. Do you know I still need to get and read Kate Deering's book if I have FN? Um, I think it can be helpful. Um, I like it. I think it gives you like a good kind of underlying of, of the science stuff, but the application is a little um, uh, like relaxed. So for me, I, I think that it's helpful, but it's, I don't think it's necessary. I think there's some people that just want to learn all they can about their metabolism. And in that case, I think how to heal your metabolism by Kate Deering is a really helpful resource to just have on hand. And I think her like meal plans and everything are a little bit restrictive, but I think the information in there is really, really life changing. Uh, will my sex hormones all be lower while I'm breastfeeding? Um, they can be. It really depends on the woman. It depends on the birth. It depends on the thyroid during pregnancy. It depends on how progesterone was pre-pregnancy. I'm telling you, you guys, your health pre-pregnancy is everything. Your health during pregnancy is everything in how you're going to recover afterwards. So it really just depends on you and your body. Some women go back to ovulating while they're breastfeeding. Some women do not ovulate nor have a period until they're done breastfeeding so it just kind of depends um, you're gonna your sex hormones usually are imbalanced post-pregnancy um, it just kind of depends on your individual health um, how imbalanced they will be um, I try like it you know I've never had a child but I help my clients you know post-pregnancy it's a really good idea prolactin is a stress hormone like we always call it like the hormone of breast milk and everything but we don't want our prolactin levels to be too high 
either. And we don't want our estrogen levels to be too high. Estrogen is a, a hormone of shock and stress. And then on top of it, when we are, you know, newly mothers, we are not getting enough sleep a lot. We're not eating as regularly as frequently. And here we are out, not only feeding ourselves and, and recovering from pregnancy, we are now feeding a child and creating more like a fuel mill, you know? And so we need to really make sure that we prepare for being able to eat frequently while breastfeeding. Whether that means you, you know, rallying hubby and saying, hey, you're gonna have a baking marathon for me and you're gonna put together some crock pot meals so I can throw them in the crock pot while you're at work. You know, you got to really prioritize eating frequently because too, too little food and too little sleep is a recipe for hormonal disaster. And I see it all of the time. Women are actually worse off a year after they had their baby than when they had their baby and they never they don't recover until they get on that plan of like eating frequently taking care of their bodies getting out in the sunshine going on walks and I know it's hard and you kind of have like this new little being that's like completely regulating your your schedule you know you, you just go by the beat of their drum but it's so important to really focus on you during that time as much as you possibly can and do what needs to get done to eat frequently and sneak in sleep when you can. So, you know, try to get somebody to come around, you know, once or twice a week so that you can take a nap really quickly. Or, um, you know, try to get someone to cook you some, some good meals or go grocery shopping for you. Say, hey, like this would really help me out. There's a lot of people that are totally willing to help new moms out as long as you just say like, hey, this would really, really be helpful to me. And um, they will be happy to do it. Like if my friend who just had a baby that said like, hey, can you go grocery shopping for me? This is my list. I'd be like, hell yeah. You know, like it's just kind of like ask for help, please ask for help because you know, women in this modern world have never ever had to do um, child rearing alone until now, right? We used to have a tribe of women that, like, if we wanted to get away for a minute, all the women in the tribe could breastfeed our baby for us. Like we could leave for two days and our baby would be breastfed by everyone else because everyone menstruated together, ovulated together, got pregnant together and had babies together and were, you know, breastfeeding together. So that was my long wind way of saying, yes, your sex hormones can be disrupted during breastfeeding, but how much is up to you? Why do you choose to avoid gluten? Um, I don't choose to avoid gluten necessarily. I choose to avoid wheat um, because wheat is hybridized and has been modified. It is no longer a grain, it is a grain grass. So it used to have only chromosomes in the 20s, now has chromosomes in the 60s. And gluten is a very, very hard to digest for people who have impaired metabolisms or impaired guts. We live in a very stressful world, right? So we have stressors coming through EMFs, we have stressors coming through chemicals, we have stressors coming through stressful jobs, Jobs, finances, um, you know, saving for a future, children, um, long commutes, working, um, and then on top of it, we're also having health issues, gut issues. There's tons of antibiotics and medications, and you know, just so many stressors coming from us at every different direction. And I can take one stressor off of my body by avoiding gluten for the most part. Or when I have grains that have gluten in them, I choose ancient grains that have very low gluten content, like spelt or einkorn flour. I don't just avoid gluten. I avoid things that are going to be super inflammatory to my gut. And so when I avoid gluten, I'm truly avoiding wheat because wheat is no longer, is very hybridized and it's usually heavily sprayed in pesticides on top of it because it's been hybridized to be more resilient to glyphosate. And um, that's gonna really wreck the gut and wreck the liver and um, kill strains of bacteria that I want sticking around. So overall, um, I, I don't really, it's not like I'm like gluten free, like, oh, I don't eat it because it doesn't have gluten. I'm very particular with what goes in my body um, because I want my body to function as good as possible. What's a better snack option similar to chips? I can't stop eating them and they're all made in vegetable oil. Um, I personally get chips that are made in coconut oil. So I don't restrict chips. I just get chips that are fried in coconut oil. Um, and you can get them on Thrive Market. You can get them on Amazon. You can get them, I get them at my health food store, but if you don't have somewhere near you, just look for, um, chips that are made in coconut oil, or there's even like Siete Foods um, fried in avocado oil, which is not my favorite oil, but it's better than vegetable oil, right? 
how do you get diagnosed with PCOS? Are there some serious signs to look out for? Um, I honestly don't like look out for a diagnosis. I think some women like are trying to get diagnosed with PCOS and it's like, uh, if, if a diagnosis would help you, f you know, feel more like inclined to take care of your body, then you want to go to your doctor, you want to tell them what your symptoms are. To get diagnosed with PCOS, you either have to have anovulatory cycles, meaning you're not ovulating, you have to have irregular periods, or you have to have polycystic ovaries show up on an ultrasound, and so any of those three, or multiple, and androgenic symptoms, or high androgens on a test. Those are usually like the two deciding factors um, to get diagnosed with PCOS or not. So obviously you have to go through all the testing. Your doctor has to see that. There are some doctors that just diagnose with people with PCOS by just an ultrasound, which is not how they're supposed to do it, but who am I to tell a doctor what to do? Um, so it's kind of one of those things where if you truly need a diagnosis, then pursue a diagnosis. But I find that that is a really futile thing for a lot of women. They pursue this diagnosis, they try to figure out what's wrong with them, and then they get they know what they already knew, which is I finally got diagnosed with PCOS. So I have PCOS. What do I do now? And it's the same shit you would have been doing if you would have just started a year before you got diagnosed. You know what I mean? So it's like one of those things where um, you, if you want a diagnosis, then pursue a diagnosis. But it's going to be, you know, a lot of work for just someone telling you, like, you have PCOS. And then the signs of PCOS can be anything. It can be, you know, not ovulating, having irregular periods, you know, horrible weight gain, having quercetism, which is hair growth on your face or body parts like in between your breasts or on your, you know, that little happy trail, just overgrowth of, of hair that's dark and coarse, um, acne, things like that, hair loss. So it just kind of depends. But um, it to me, like a diagnosis, I guess, makes you feel like, oh, finally, like I'm not crazy. There's something wrong with me. But for me, like a diagnosis if, is nothing. It, it, it means nothing. It just means that, okay, I have imbalanced hormones. That my body's telling me through symptoms something's wrong. Now, you know, what do I do about it? There's always like, what do I do about it? And um, you're going to do what you're doing regardless, right? Is doing Whole30 a good thing to try to change up the digestion and hormones literally a month, then add more? I'm not a fan of the Whole30. Um, I find that it really creates, creates confusion around food. Um, I find that a lot of women create a food fear. Um, it also restricts sugar and carbs a lot, which I don't love. Um, I'm not a huge fan of rules. I think that it really ends up creating um, this idea that certain foods are good and certain foods are bad. For example, for me, it's one of them on the Whole30 is dairy. Like, I just do not understand why people demonize dairy so harshly. Like, when you remove dairy plus processed foods and plus gluten and plus grains and plus beans, of course you feel better. And a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, dairy is, is the culprit. I'm like, what about all the processed shit you were eating along with dairy? Or the fact that you weren't eating high quality dairy? Or the the fact that we're eating dairy on wheat uh aka pizza you know what i mean like what why are we demonizing certain foods we're not a lot of people right now during like in this culture like we like to do these blanket terms like dairy is bad or cheese is bad and i'm like you can look at two th things that are technically called cheese and they're completely different on an ingredient level and this goes the same for bread for example bread is bad and i'm like well what about you know really good grains that are risen and and properly sprouted and fermented those are like so rich in b vitamins and fermented foods that's incredible for your gut and then there's that bread that sits on the shelf yeah that's not even to me bread right it's like it's like some processed crap and so we've got to start looking towards ingredients and start eating nutrient dense foods we got to stop sticking to these weird ass diets i'm not paleo i'm not whole 30 i eat to fuel my body i understand my food i have knowledge surrounding my food. I know how to traditionally prepare my food so that my body can recognize it and comprehend it. I eat because I enjoy what I eat, but my body also craves what it needs. And to me, Whole30 does not provide that to most women. It just creates more food fear around food. And it also just honestly teaches them restriction. It teaches them rules around food, which we've got to get out of if we want to start being empowered around our food. Um, and on top of it, digestion is going to feel better when you restrict things, right? But you tie them back in, right? You tie dairy back in, right? And your digestive issues come back. Um, you didn't fix anything, right? <laughs> you didn't fix anything. You just restricted it. You felt better while it's off and then you put it back in and oh, it's back because nothing was fixed. 
Why would good sourced dairy cause breakouts? Um, most of the times it's gonna be gut issues. If you have severe gut issues, sometimes dairy is gonna be an issue for you. Also milk and meat is high in L-tryptophan, which can sometimes be a problem for people with severe gut dysbiosis or, or gut challenges and so, it's not necessarily the dairy, it's the, the inflammation that's being driven by the bacteria in the gut. So when people say like dairy is causing the issue, I say no, 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 bacteria is causing the issue and dairy is just, um, I guess, expressing this bacterial issue. So a lot of times it is bacterial in nature. If dairy is causing an issue for the skin, it's most likely um, uh, an intolerance to the byproducts that these bacteria or even funguses are producing in the gut. We gotta kill those first. Did you say E2 or A2 milk? This could be a dumb question, but what is that? So A2 milk is, is um, from cows that have not been genetically modified, whereas we actually took, uh, I don't wanna say genetically modified, but that's kind of what it is. We took cows and we kind of bred the ones that created the most milk, which caused this like enzyme reaction in the milk. And so it caused them to, to produce more of a specific amino acid and um, their offspring now creates like more of this like more inflammatory milk. Some people can tolerate it just fine, but some people that are really sensitive to milk only do good with A2 milk. And so the French did not adopt these cows. They still use, I think it's Jersey cows, I want to say. And A2 milk is specifically from um, the, the cows that have not been messed with or, or um, uh, tweaked. And their milk tends to be less uh, histamine producing or less inflammatory. Recently diagnosed with Hashimoto's and an insane CRP level of 31 in some. Any suggestions? Yeah, that's super high. I've seen the highest one I've ever seen is 38, which within a month I got my client down to two. So, um, I, it really just eat anti-inflammatory, avoid wheat like the plague. Honestly, wheat is going to be the biggest, like honestly, the biggest contributor to inflammation. Wheat is the devil. Um, and then I also use proteolytic enzymes. Um, trying to think what else I do. Uh, vin apple cider vinegar can be really helpful. So really like working on the gut, but really like these questions are hard for me because when somebody comes to me with a specific issue, I always say, okay, we've got to look at the hormones, the adrenals, the gut, you know, um, the minerals, the vitamins. I got to comb through your diet, your health history, your sleep habits. You know, I got to go over it all. It's, it's, it, a lot of people think like, oh, it's a simple question. How do I get my inflammation down? It's like, no, no, no. Like there are a thousand things driving this issue and they all need to be dealt with to really get it down and keep it down. How do you address bacterial overgrowth if you're sensitive to dairy at the moment and you hope to someday come back to cheese? I'd be happy with feta and goat even. Yeah, so I'm actually going, this is my next program. So um, I wanted to create something that was very foundational and is not quite a protocol. Um, but now, um, and I, I don't wanna announce it, like this is very up and it's in beta. It's like starting to be in the works. I'm not gonna ever put a date on it. I think it's gonna be like early 2020, but it's going to be a gut program, a gut protocol. Because for me, like to give you guys tips here and there, it might help you in a sense, but you guys really need to know how to do a gut protocol. And you guys need to be able to walk through yourself if you're not willing to work with an expert and have them like lead you through one because you can do this and this and you know take this probiotic that this person says and this probiotic that this person says and it's just gonna be like you're never gonna find the answer so um, when it comes to bacterial overgrowth, we have to understand that gut issues have a root cause of metabolic issues we haven't been eating enough we haven't been eating the right nutrients we've been too restrictive we haven't been providing our body with what it needs. We've been under way too much stress. We've been over exercising. We've been, um, you know, living in, in an environment that's super, super stressful for us. We're not deep breathing. We're not taking care of ourselves. I can go on and on, not sleeping. And so the, the body gets stressed out and becomes more um, open up to these pathogens and these pathogens are opportunistic so they create byproducts that start to break down our own digestion and trick our immune system so for example candida can actually create something called interleukin and interleukin makes the immune system think it's fine even though there's a fungus overgrowth very apparent and a lot of people make the mistake of cutting sugar when they're trying to heal gut issues you are in trying to kill bacteria, you are killing yourself. You are starving yourself and you, your organism, your body is the 
only thing powerful enough to know what to do with pathogens. You cannot kill them yourself. Your body, your immune system kills them. And when we starve ourselves of sugar, we starve our bodies. We don't starve pathogens, by the way, because pathogens create byproducts that raise our blood sugar and force our body to eat our own tissues to feed them. So when we starve pathogens of sugar, they are making their own sugar. Don't, don't worry about that. They will eat you in order to keep sugar coming to them. The only thing that you're starving is yourself. And when you're starving yourself, you're causing thyroid issues, adrenal issues, which is just making the bacteria worse. So we have to break the vicious cycle. We need to eat enough. We need to eat plenty. We need to eat enough carbohydrate. We need to eat enough protein. We gotta eat enough fat. Um, and then we have to kind of figure out what's going on. Is it fungal? Is it bacterial? This is where comprehensive stool analysis comes in. Not everyone runs one, but I think they're really helpful because then we know exactly what we're dealing with. Some people are like, oh, I think I have candida. And then we run a, a test and it's like, no, they have every pathogen in the book except for fungus or vice versa. They think, oh, I got like certain bacteria. They've been taking probiotics and oh, sure enough, they have like wrecked their guts. And so it's really not a good idea to go in blind. The second thing with when it comes to gut issues, we really need to understand that we're really trying to create a, an environment that it has no oxygen because pathogens thrive in oxygen rich environments. And this is why babies that drink breast milk are the healthiest. It's because the breast milk only feeds pathogens or not pathogens, but bacteria that are non-oxygen producing or promoting. And those prebiotics in the breast milk also just feed certain bacteria that are not oxygen producing. And so when we start to take certain probiotics or we start to create an oxygen rich environment in our gut, whether we're eating really crappy, um, crappy food, processed food, polyunsaturated fats, um, we're eating lots of what else? Oh, like um, non-organic foods can really create more of an oxygen rich environment. These pathogens are now creating more and more oxygen and they're they're growing and growing and growing and they're overpowering our own bacteria that live in no oxygen environments. And so we have to really rebalance that scale and we gotta wreck the oxygen that's in our gut. We gotta starve our guts of oxygen. The way that we can do this is vitamin C, sodium acetate, um, what else can we do? Enzymes, we can do iodine, we can do zinc, we can do, um, Mm, what else am I thinking? Oh, horseradish does it too. You know, there are things that we can do to actually pull oxygen from our gut so pathogens can no longer survive there any longer. Um, but this is gonna be like kind of a protocol that I'll create because I think it, I think it is something that um, so many of you need. You guys have been doing like the whole Western model, which is even functional doctors do it. They, co they go after your, your pathogens with herbs <laughs> and they're trying to kill them. And I'm like, they're not gonna die. Like, go ahead, try it out and, and come back to me in five months when they're back because you can't kill candida unless your body is there's no environment for candida to thrive anymore or bacterial overgrowth to thrive anymore you've got to restore that migrating motor complex which is this electrical impulse this contraction that happens in your small intestine every hour and a half or so to keep the small intestine sterile the only thing that can do that is getting your metabolism up and getting your body back up. So many people, after they start eating frequently, keeping their blood sugar steady, after about three weeks to four weeks, they can tolerate dairy again. Is a hair test worth doing? I believe it shows heavy metals. Yeah, it shows minerals and it shows heavy metals, and it kind of shows can show you a lot of indicators of what's going on in your endocrine system um, because each mineral kind of plays into itself. What do you think about essential oils? <laughs> LOL. Yeah, LOL is right. Um, so I'm not like a, a lot of people love to like polarize things. And just because I'm not a huge fan of essential oils does not mean that I don't I, I think that they're bad. I just think that essential oils are really used improperly. They should never be taken internally ever, ever, ever. Um, I honestly like I will say this with love. You are an idiot if you take them internally. An idiot. Um, they're so harsh on the liver and they're so harsh on the body just because it's natural doesn't mean it's any um not any harsher than something like advil or tylenol or something it's it's just as harsh a lot of oils and a lot of plants in general you guys we need to start thinking of plants as medicine we're we're starting in our culture to see plants as food which no culture has really ever done until very recently within the past couple hundred years until 
recently we've seen animal products as food and plants as medicine for very medicinal uses. They should be treated with respect and power. And they do have a lot of estrogenic natures and should only be used on an as needed basis. Obviously using essential oil is better than using something like a medication, especially if if it works and if it's doing the job that you need it to do. Um, but that's not to say that there is an application for medications because there are. Um, I also think that there's too much misinformation going on right now. These big companies like doTERRA and Young Living, they're trying to get you to sell and they're trying to get you to have people sign up under you. They're not doing their job to educate you. And they also lie to you because they like you to think that their product is superior to somebody else's when in reality, most of these essential oils are gotten from the same source. Because for example, something like frankincense has to be um, uh, collected from specific specific trees in specific regions. And so what they do, essential oil companies actually pay these tribes to go collect it in their native environment and then bring it back and the essential oil companies will buy the um, herbs from them. And all of the essential oil companies buy them from the same tribes or the same villages. And we can't say that like, oh, this company like produces its own, like frankincense only grows in certain areas or, or this or that. So there's just a lot of misinformation, honestly to God, just lying going on that just really irks me and then on top of it there's just a lack of respect regarding essential oils the phenols which are little plant compounds really are attracted to fatty tissue and so I see people just like rubbing essential oils all over their thyroid and I just want to like cringe and melt into the floor like I'm just like oh my god like please like don't do that because that fatty tissue of your thyroid is just attracting those phenols to itself and they're just storing up in your thyroid um and then they're estrogenic, right? And so we know estrogen is anti-thyroid. And so these phenols are attracted to the fatty tissue and they're estrogenic. And so they're just burdening that thyroid gland. So I am just not a huge fan of topical application either. I think they should be used on an as needed basis, very conservatively and very diluted, never internally and best in an, like an aromatherapy type setting. You know, you're breathing them in through a diffuser. They can be very relaxing, very, you know, um, very therapeutic for just kind of like keeping stress low, but we gotta stop slathering ourselves in these estrogenic oils. Lavender specifically being horrible for um, estrogen issues. It's so estrogenic, it can actually turn a male fetus more female. So, um, Pregnant women need to be especially careful with essential oils. I will never touch an essential oil when I'm pregnant, just letting you guys know, um, because they're so powerfully estrogenic. Um, so overall, they just need to be respected more, um, and there needs to be a lot less misinformation. But two brands that I really love and trust that are not under that like MLM pyramid type scheme is um, uh, Plant Therapy, available on Amazon, and then Mountain Rose Herbs is also a really pure, natural source. I really like both those brands. Super cheap, right? Because essential oils should not be expensive. <laughs> What can I do to increase sex drive? I haven't had a period in a year and have insulin resistance PCOS and it makes it difficult. Yeah, so, you know, we want to increase our energy. We want to increase our, our thyroid function. We want to increase our vitality. The best thing we can do is eat frequently every two hours, protein, carbon, fat, um, making sure we're getting mostly saturated fats and um, not doing too many vegetables. And also we want to make sure we're having a bowel movement every single day to keep those toxins moving. Um, uh, some people like maca powder for increasing libido, but um, I think that pregnenolone is helpful. Sometimes progesterone can be helpful. Um, cacao butter, any type of chocolate is going to be really, really um, uh, an aphrodisiac. So I, I really en encourage my girls that have libido issues to eat chocolate every single day. A really, you know, high quality dark chocolate that, that contains some cocoa butter and some chocolate. Um, what else? What else? Um, making sure that you're eating plenty of carbs, plenty of sugar, but then also plenty of fats. Like I just said, the chocolate's really, really helpful. But honestly, chocolate's where it's at. Um, and uh, cocoa butter is really, really helpful. It's also helpful uh, like uh, to help with vaginal dryness because it's very rich in vitamin A and E. But honestly, getting to the bottom of what's driving your hormonal conditions is gonna be the best. Like you've got to get your hormones back on, on the train, so to speak. You've gotta get, you know, your body, your blood sugar balance, and you've got to get your body creating more hormones again, because that's the only thing that's truly going to bring your libido back. 
Hi Jess, is fire tea okay on an empty stomach or should I eat it first because of the honey? Oh no, you can eat it on a, you can drink it on an empty stomach. That's totally fine. I like to sometimes start my day with fire tea so that um, it helps my digestion kind of flow. And I like to have some sugar right in the morning. So I'll either do like fire tea with, with like a good amount of honey or I'll do orange juice and some collagen really quickly or like right when I wake up. Um, because sometimes it's hard to get breakfast in like, you know, right away. And so I want to get something in my stomach um, so that my body's not starving. Ways to raise cholesterol, since cholesterol precursor to hormones, may try and raise cholesterol to see if jump starts hormones. Um, have you ever looked into pregnenolone? Cholesterol is, um, the best way to increase cholesterol is to increase the health of both your liver and your gut um, to make sure you're eating enough. That's kind of be the biggest thing for like bringing back your period and getting your cholesterol up. A lot of people don't realize that just stress is just gonna deplete you so quickly. So brewer's yeast and nutritional yeast is gonna really help give you B vitamins that are gonna help support the liver. And then you want to make sure you're eating enough, like 2,000 to 2,500 calories. Make sure they're, most of your fats are coming from saturated sources. You're not overdoing it on the vegetables and really focusing on nutrient density. Um, and then I would look into pregnenolone. I think that pregnenolone is a really, really good option for, for some women with HA. Um, it's not appropriate for everyone, but it is worth to have on your radar. And... Um, that can really, really help. So, because cholesterol first converts into pregnenolone, right? And then pregnenolone is gonna uh, convert into all the other hormones. And so sometimes supplementing pregnenolone kind of helps kickstart all the other hormones that are in its downline. So pregnenolone turns into progesterone, DHEA, and cortisol, right? And then DHEA is gonna turn into estrogen and testosterone. And so sometimes supplementing just a tiny bit of pregnenolone can really, really help you know, speed up that process as long as you're working on your diet too, making sure you're eating enough, you're eating frequently, you're taking stress off the body whenever possible. And um, a lot of times those two are kind of a match made in heaven, especially if you've been taking bioidenticals like progesterone or, or estrogen and they haven't been seeming to do much for you. Where can I get organic cranberry concentrate? I get it in uh, my health food store. It's like where all the glass bottled juices are. You'll find like a little small bottle of, of cranberry concentrate, but you could also get it on like Thrive Market or Amazon or something like that. But I get it at my local health food store. Like I don't get everything at the health food store because it just can get so expensive. But like there are some specialty items that like I'll stock up on every couple weeks. And that's one of them um, because, you know, normal grocery store stores don't carry organic cranberry juice concentrate. What do you think of the whole rise in people blaming parasitic worms for their gut issues? I think it's funny because they are not understanding what's going on and they are like, oh my God, the parasites like eat, eat the rotting meat in your gut. And I'm just like, oh. you know, like it's just so not based in science. Like there is science to gut issues for sure. There's se severe things lurking in there. It's just not like parasitic worms. I promise you guys, I run comprehensive gut analysis all the time that tests for parasitic worms. And I've only had like two clients that have parasitic worms. A lot of people have like protozoal parasites or they'll have tons of bacterial overgrowth or fungus or bacteria, but very rarely does someone have a parasitic worm unless they've like traveled outside of the country that they're from or, you know, they like drank some like contaminated water or something like that. But a lot of times they don't have parasitic worms. <laughs> I have PCOS and lately I've had more bruising on my legs. Aside from anemia, does that show deficiency in anything that I could work on before getting blood work done? Estrogen. So estrogen-based issues can drive any type of clotting or blood issues. This is why women who are young get brain aneurysms sometimes because estrogen causes clotting. And so it's so important, like bruising on your legs is a lot of times a sign of um, estro high estrogen in relationship to progesterone. It can actually be a sign of endocrine imbalance or hormonal imbalance. Do you have any tips for hair loss and androgen excess? Um, yes, get your stress levels down. Understand why your body is raising your androgens. Androgens are protective against cortisol, adrenaline, and estrogen. And so this is why our body raises androgens. Where are your progesterone levels at? How often are you eating? Are you over-exercising? Are you in a stressful relationship? Are you sleeping? Are you getting enough sunlight? Are you strength training only a little every single week you know what i mean so there's lots of things that drive stress which in turn our body has to respond to the stress in the proper way to protect our tissues because stress causes our body to go through more nutrients not less and so our body don't doesn't run on thin air and so if we're not eating enough and forcing our body to break down its own tissues it will do so and our body needs to protect itself and so that's why it I, why it increases androgens. Hair loss is almost always driven by 
high T3, low T3, or thyroid issues, or um, high estrogen and stress and inflammation. Lymph nodes in my neck swell every few months. Gut tonsillitis, strep often. Sure, there's an underlying cause, but it's so bad right now that it hurts to turn my head. Anything I can do to ease the pain right now? Gargle coconut oil, girl. Like, obviously go to the doctor, but gargle coconut oil quickly um, and do it um, because it's super antibacterial, but you need to keep it in your mouth for a, about 10 minutes. So break down those fatty acid chains and then, you know, keep it in your mouth for about 10 minutes and gargle it and get it on the, on the throat. But look into your vitamin A levels because uh, low vitamin A can cause you to be more susceptible to streptococcus um, and streptococcus is what drives tonsillitis and strep. Okay guys, so it's going to cut me off right now. I see your, your question, um, Mrs. Fuentes. Ask it again. I don't see the whole thing. So ask it again in my next live. I'm going to go live for one more hour.